<laughs> they said that I should install Arch Linux. Welcome to the Arch installation video. Now, unlike the other videos where I'm actually guiding you on how to do something, this is going to be me probably failing very badly at installing Arch Linux. A lot of people on the forum were saying, hey, you should install Arch, you'll probably like it. I don't like new things, I fear change. I have a lot of experience with Debian and Ubuntu and Red Hat and CentOS and some experience with OpenSUSE, but I don't really have a lot of experience with, with Arch. I tried it once a long time ago, I think it was version 01 or 02, something like that. That version was a little rough around the edges. And at that time, I think I was trying to do an MBR installation. I'm not sure if UEFI was even a thing. So now we've got this relatively new ASRock B-Box. Now this is our fanless mini PC that we got from ASRock. I'm going to install Arch on this. It's got an M SATA 128 gig SSD on it. This is probably only a temporary installation. I'm gonna install Arch to the M SATA SSD and then I may transplant the SSD into another system to use for future Arch videos. But for now, this is just gonna be my journey into installing Arch and sort of my commentary. So we've booted up the USB and we're at the installation prompt, which is just the command prompt. This is all it does. There's no graphical installer. There's no anything. Looking at the documentation for this and sort of reading up on Arch and looking, you know, I didn't go into it completely blind. Uh, it was sort of described as someone dumping a huge box of Legos in front of you and then saying, okay, there you go. And while that's okay, I'm not really sure that I'm going to be super nostalgic about the days of like installing Slackware. Um, this is what it sort of reminds me of so far. It's like, oh, the days of install installing Slackware. I've got these 27 floppy disks and I'm going to put the first one in and sort of boot off of it and do some things and I'm going to put the next one in and then please insert the next one. And You haven't lived until you've untarballed a tarball from a floppy disk. I mean, really, you haven't. So without further ado, let's get started. Now, at the command prompt here, I've just done an LS to see what's here. It's kind of like the text adventure Zork. It's like you're standing before a mailbox. All right, sounds good. Uh, less install.txt. Cool, an installation guide. Not really, it just sort of gives you the, the high level overview of what you need to do to actually do stuff. So if I run fdisk uh, l so that I can see the disks installed in the system, I can see that SDA is my 128 gig SSD. Looks right, although it's saying that the sector size is 512 bytes, which I know to be incorrect, but hey, whatever, don't even care. Now, working with EFI systems is a little bit of a pain. I know that I'm going to use Grub, and I know that Grub in this configuration is probably gonna need two partitions. One, sort of a BIOS boot partition, and one that is a partition for uh, the actual EFI file system, which is a FAT32. So let's create both of those partitions. First partition, first sector's fine. Last sector, that's gonna be plus one meg. Uh, T, we're gonna change the type of partition one. We're gonna do L to list the codes. I think I want number four BIOS boot, although I would not swear to that. We're gonna create another partition, number two, yep, plus 100 meg. That's the recommended EFI size. It's not actually documented in the EFI, but that's the default partition size on Windows systems, so I'm gonna assume that Microsoft knows what they're doing, or they cleverly left that out of the documentation somehow. I'm gonna change the type of that one, number two, list the codes, I think it's number one, yep, all right. Number one, whoops, new partition, number three, whatever, whatever, Linux system, that's fine. So here's the deal. I didn't create a swap partition. Normally you would probably want another swap partition that's eight or 16 gigabytes in size. Uh, the old rule of thumb was that twice the amount of RAM is what you wanted for swap. That's ridiculous, don't even do that. It's about, if you've got eight gigabytes of RAM, you probably don't want to swap larger than four or eight gigs. If you've got 16 gigabytes, you probably don't want to swap larger than eight gigs. If you've got 32 or 64 gigabytes of memory, you probably don't want to swap larger than four or eight gigs. So really the rule of thumb is make your swap four or eight gigs, whatever sounds good to you. In my case, because I'm running 128 gig SSD for this demo, I don't want to give up the space. I'm actually not going to create a swap partition uh, you can create a swap file. There's additional overhead when you create a file on the file system to handle swap, but uh, swap is what's used when your computer runs out of physical memory, basically. If I have seven gigs used and I go to load a four gig program, uh, it's not gonna work. But with swap, 
it can it's the system is able to swap out stuff to disk that hasn't been used in a while and actually load up something so that the total amount of used memory is more than you actually physically have in the system but with modern systems where you've got relatively large capacities eight gigabytes or more you don't really need to worry about that if you've got a system that's got four gigabytes of ram it's probably a good idea that you have a four or eight gigabyte swap partition if you have a system that's got 128 gigabytes of ram you really probably don't want to put a swap partition larger than 8 or 16 gigabytes. And this is really owing to the speed at which those things operate. I mean, if you have a mechanical hard drive and you have a, a swap file of even 2 gigabytes, it's going to make the system glacial if you actually do hit your memory limit. It's, it's almost always better to have the thing error with an out of memory condition. So. In this case, we're not going to make a swap partition. All right, I've written the partitions. What's the next step in the installation? All right, the next thing in the installation guide seems to be to make sure that you're on the internet. And the next thing is to actually format those file systems that we made. I'm going to take the EFI partition and format it FAT32. For the other one, I'm going to use BTRFS because I like to live dangerously. Ah, that's probably fine on dev sta 3 Now we need to mount this on slash MNT. Now we need to mount the boot partition. And I think that's it. Now I think we bootstrap the system. So I'm gonna install the base system and the developer tools. The developer tools will allow us to build packages from uh, the users, like the user packages or user supplied packages. I have a feeling I'm going to be compiling things one way or another anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and install the base development packages as well. Okay, that should do it. I had to specify the slash MNT folder, which is the new root file system of the new installation that we're doing. It's going to install a bunch of things. Yep, sounds good. Now we need to generate a file system table or FS tab. All right now we need to specify our locale, which is ENUS. I'll go with UTF-8. Could also do ISO 8859-1, but UTF-8 is probably fine. All right, that's generated. Now we need to enable it. Wow, it calls EDT EST5 EDT. Okay. Okay, we've updated our hardware clock. Now we have to name it. That's going to be the name of this computer. Is that a password? All right, we've got a UEFI system, so we're gonna do pacman-s dosfs tools. I'm not booted with EFI. <laughs> Typo on my part. Yeah, now you know why I name every computer after some type of horrible failure. Doesn't matter what it is. I fail at everything. It booted. Hey, and I can log in. <laughs> That's incredible. All right, now I need to get GNOME up and running. So now we're gonna install GNOME. And those are all the dependencies. Uh, looks like the installation's done. Probably the next thing to do would be to add a user, I guess. Okay, looks like I got GDM as a result of installing GNOME, the GNU Display Manager. Um, do I have XORG? No, I did not have XOR. Okay, I'll need to get that. I'm not sure if Pac-Man has a recommends. So on Debian, I'm used to uh, when I just willy-nilly select a package, the package maintainer can say, well, this is not a dependency, but it probably would be a good idea if you installed ABC XYZ. And it's like, oh, cool, thank you, that's helpful. I'm not really seeing an equivalent on Pac-Man. Now, from what I understand about Arch, uh, there are about 5,800 packages in the core arch repository and then everything else comes from r a u r i think they just moved to r4 looks like on august 8th 2015 so uh, i guess that's more like a more up-to-date r one thing so far about arch is that if you're not a noob the documentation is actually very good if you are a noob the documentation is not going to make any sense okay now that that's installed 
Let's see if it set the system to start it up. Wow, ad user didn't even make my home folder. That's weird, because there's an uh, slash etc slash scale, which has bash profile, bash logout, and bash rc, but it didn't make me a home folder. I guess it'll do that the next time I log in, maybe? That seems unnecessarily silly. Once again, <laughs> this feels like Slackware. Well, at least that worked that time to log in. Apparently, xorg xinit is not installed by default when you install xorg. That's my problem. All right, I think what I'm gonna do is add some stuff to my Xenet RC and hope for the best. Well, not, not too surprising. It didn't really start the, uh, the graphical environment automatically, but I have Xenet now, so there, there's that at least. Did I start GDM manually? Will that end badly? Yeah, wow, I think my graphics is locked up. NumLock and Caps Lock still work, but I can't do anything else otherwise. I'll just reboot. All right, well, I can, the least I can do is install Xterm. Hey, Xterm, oh my God, we're in X. All right, and my mouse works. The lesson here is don't run GDM, I guess. Oh, this thing's probably System D. Yeah, that's why there wasn't an init script. Wow, there we are, System D. And <laughs> it's GNOME. Oh my goodness. Practically nothing installed, but that's cool. I was like, I'm pretty sure I saw a GNOME terminal being installed. Oh, it logged me in correctly and everything. This is exciting. <laughs> it's like the old Slackware days. Uh, Firefox? Is this Firefox? Maybe I can get both of those? Oh, right. Right, I have to do that too. What did I just do? I don't know what's going on in that window. <laughs> So I'm just gonna nope right out of there. Nope. I'll just use escape that time instead of control C because apparently this version of VI is booby trapped. I've never seen that before. That's interesting. Nice, it worked. Why would Control C do that? That's really weird. I'm sure somebody will tell me in the comments. Probably my key map or something silly like that. I'm not sure if I have audio. Let me see if I can do this real quick. So, uh, when I fiddled with my audio, I managed to destroy it somehow. Oops. So, the rest of the video is really just a synopsis of what the rest of it was, except for the outro, which somehow survived. I don't know. I sort of knocked the microphone and the cable was loose, and because I didn't have my headphones in, I didn't hear it. And then at the end, it was like, oh, let me just fix that, and I guess it was fine. So, synopsis of what happened. Uh, Network Manager in GNOME was not working, but that's not really a big deal, because I had to enable it in System D, which is just, you know... Uh, system CTL, you know, status network manager dot service and dealing with all that and getting that up and running. So that's not really a big deal. You can sort of see that on the screen. Then I was able to, once I've got network manager up and running, I was able to install Steam and I just used Pac-Man to install Steam and that was fine. But then running Pac-Man, the fonts were messed up. So I had to get another package to fix that. I did have to install lib32-mesa-libgl, which uh, required me to update the Pac-Man mirror list. I had to enable another mirror for that package. I also had the choice of some NVIDIA-specific packages, but as I'm running Intel HD 3000 on this box for now, uh, I was able to install that with Pac-Man, and not really a big deal. I was also able to install i7z. i7z is a utility that will let you see what's going on with the turbo and speed step of your CPU. And I was delighted to find that our little B-Box was happily clocking along long at 2 gigahertz the whole time. Sometimes with Linux kernels and Turbo, it can be a little squirrely, especially on newer stuff, and this thing is 14 nanometers. And that's a testament to how up-to-date Arch is with the rolling releases, is that basically all of that stuff worked. I didn't have to think about it. Everything was there. There was no, like, messing with packages or getting a testing package or anything like that. Everything was basically there. And i7z showed that the CPU was upclocking past its advertised speed of 1 gigahertz. And then the heat dissipation capabilities of the enclosure that the B-Box is in means that it's basically in turbo all the time. 2 gigahertz all the time, basically. Even though it's only a 1 gigahertz box. Now with the Steam messed up fonts, I did try to do Pac-Man install Steam-fonts. <laughs> it was not to be too easy. 
Okay, so then a little bit of Googling, a little bit of searching, a little bit of poking it with a sharpened stick. I was able to figure it out. Uh, basically what I needed to do was install TTF-Liberation, and then I was all up and running with Steam. And then of course, once I was up and running with Steam, the next thing to do was to see how well Steam and home streaming works. Now, we took a look at Steam and home streaming and the Windows side of things, and that worked like a champ. The real thing that I was wondering about here was, could I turn this thing into sort of a media center on steroids? Now, Arch has Kodi, which used to be Xbox Media Center. You guys have probably seen the installing the Kodi Media Center on a Raspberry Pi or something like that. Now, you can install that on Arch and run it as a package, and so that'll be maybe another video later because we're going to do that with with uh, the B-Box and maybe a Thecus NAS and a 65-inch TV, and we're going to get all kinds of media center crazy. But for now, for the B-Box, I just want to install Steam. I want to do Steam in-home streaming and see if maybe it's a viable thing that I can have a Linux box that I can do Linux box stuff with that is a sort of home theater PC that I could run Kodi on, but that I can also do Steam and home streaming on. I want sort of both of those things. Raspberry Pi doesn't have enough horsepower to, to do that properly. This thing seems like it might, and so I was delighted once I got Steam actually up and running. It actually ran really well. It, it ran probably about as good as it does on Windows. Now, I did not game extensively on Windows, so I don't know if there's like a hiccup or if it has problems with it or whatever. On Linux, it was basically flawless. So I was really impressed by that. Obviously, Valve has done a lot of work on Linux and getting it running. Officially, Arch is not a supported platform for Steam, and if you're a noob, I would definitely recommend not doing this. But it does mean that you can install another flavor of Linux on the B-Box and basically be up and running with Steam in Home Streaming, the Kodi Media Center, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, we've got another video coming up where we're going to do a little bit more with the B-Box and also a Thecus NAS. Now, the, the Thecus Network Attached Storage, those are basically Linux boxes. The one we're going to take a look at has five drives. They've retooled it so that it's quieter, the operation is quieter, and they've also added a built-in UPS to the model that we're going to take a look at. So between Linux, whatever your flavor of Linux happens to be, the B-Box and the Thecus NAS, you can actually run two different media centers in your house because the Thecus can run sort of its own media center and then the B-Box can actually do 4K, Steam in-home streaming, and the whole nine yards. So between those two things, you can basically be off to the races. Now I think everybody needs a Linux server in their house. It's like a vacuum cleaner almost, or you know, I don't know, indoor plumbing. You know, every a Linux server in every house. And that seems silly, but if you want to claw back your privacy from Microsoft and Google and Apple and all of the other companies out there, you can actually run your own services on your own stuff. And Linux is sort of the way that you're going to do that. I mean, how do you do that without, you know, involving Microsoft on some level? Well, you know, pragmatic solution is you don't have to go completely over. I mean, it's, it's not as if you have to switch over to Linux completely exclusively. It's not really what I'm advocating. I'm saying more of the pragmatic approach. Use Windows, use Mac, use Linux for whatever it's good for. But for keeping your documents and keeping them safe and doing all that, Linux is the answer and your home server is one way to get out of the cloud or you can have a server in the cloud that you pay for and then people are not going to be spying on you on your own server. But more about that in a future video. This has really been just about me installing Arch and admittedly I'm kind of a noob with Arch although I kind of know what I'm doing with Linux so if you have any questions, comments or you want to call me out on something dumb that I did because there's at least five or six things in there that I did that were pretty dumb uh, you can head on over to the forums at techsyndicate.com. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out. I'll see you later.